Victor readjusted the shovels on his shoulder and stepped gingerly over an old, half-sunken grave. Hi, this is Memo, and today we're talking about Vicious by Victoria Schwab. Okay, I will start some non-spoilers, and then when I get to the spoiler section, I'll let you know. This is a very, very red book. If you like red books, this book got you covered. Look at this. Look at this beautiful red. Love the cover of this book. I don't know if the video is doing justice to this beautiful red. There are like little, little black glossy skulls and bones and everything. There's this little guy making like an eye. Beautiful. Okay, can we take 10 seconds and talk about something? Am I the only person who is bothered by this? Why do publishing companies put quotes on the freaking cover of the books? Just put it on the bag. Put it on the back. I don't even know who even cares about the quotes. Does anyone ever read a quote and like, in this one, where Entertainment Weekly says this is addictive. Like, do you just, oh, wow. If Entertainment Weekly says this is addictive, I must go get this book. Oh, <laughs> hang on a second. It's not even about this book. It was about the Shades of Magic series. Why is there a quote on the cover of this book from the Shades of Magic series? Put it in the back. They all go on the back. Cover, leave it clean so that I can enjoy this beautiful cover art by Will Stahl. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your last name incorrectly, but fantastic work. Vicious is about two mysterious anime boyfriends who are super intelligent, super cool, and who also happen to be roommates. They are different people, they speak differently, they have different faces, but inside they are same same. Same same, but different. But still same. Actually this is what I can say for pretty much all the characters in this book. For example, there is Serena, who is same, but a girl. And then there's Sydney, who is same, but a kid. And then there's Angie. Who was Angie again? Angie is the girlfriend. But she is so intelligent that she's getting so many job offers. Companies are lining up to get Angie. She's such a brilliant engineering student that all the companies think that she will also do a fantastic job whatever position they hire her for. They don't even offer her an internship or anything. It's a full-time manager, nay, director position right off the school because she is such a fantastic engineer. That's why. And companies have ways of finding that out, okay? They're always talking to the schools. If you're a great student, you will see tons of companies fighting over you before you even graduate. You don't even have to apply. And there's Mitch. Well, Mitch is kind of different, I guess, but it's just unfortunate he has no arc at all. This book takes place over a 10-year span of time, and whatever you get on the first page is pretty much whatever you get on the last page, character-wise. Everyone stays the same, relationships change. It's more about those relationships changing and getting strained than character development, I would say. Which is not a bad thing because this book deals with superheroes and superheroes don't really change. I mean, think about Spider-Man. Sure, he had that weird emo phase, but who hasn't? But once he was through that phase, he was back to Spider-Man we all loved. So think of these characters a little bit like that. The story revolves around Victor and Eli, who are college roommates. And for their senior thesis, they decide that they share a common interest. One of them is studying adrenaline, and the other one decides to study superheroes. And then they randomly decide that there is a correlation between developing a superpower and adrenaline and near-death experiences. And even though neither of them has ever seen a superhero in their entire lives, they decide that if there were superheroes, there would be a correlation between adrenaline and near-death experiences that create superpowers in people. 
in this universe, people with superpowers are called EOs for extraordinaries. And even though they're supposed to be going to a super high level prestigious science school and they're top of their class, they decide to do their thesis on this completely bonkers subject. And even their teacher acknowledges it, but then he is like, I will let you do this because you are so cool and so intelligent. I don't want to hold you back from coming up with something incredible and groundbreaking in science. So the whole hypothesis of this thesis is just based on, he just read some comics and saw some superheroes and just decided that if superheroes exists, it's because of that. And it is because of, <laughs> turns out it is because of that. What do you know? So he was just so smart without even doing any experiments, no observation at all. Skip all the scientific process, he just gets to the result because he is that smart of a person, okay? You need observations to start your hypotheses in your scientific field? Well, too bad. You're never gonna be as good as Eli, and you know that. Eli doesn't need any of the pesky scientific process steps. He just gets the result, because he's Eli. Eli is so cool and so intelligent. By the way, none of these are spoilers. They're all on the back cover. It says, Victor and Eli started out as college roommates. Brilliant, arrogant, lonely boys, mysterious anime boyfriends. But right, not exactly, but the story is told through time jumps in that 10 year span of time. I personally am not a fan of time jumps unless they reveal something. If they reveal a change in a character, if they reveal any sort of secret, if they reveal any plot development, then I'm all for it. But in this book, it's mostly backstory, and I know that a lot of people love backstory and lore. I don't necessarily like it a lot. I'm mostly focused on the current story that's happening, and what I mainly care about is how anything that happens in this book affects the main story. I don't necessarily care about how people met unless it was under very different circumstances and they were different people and their relationships were different and then it evolved into something else and they changed into different people, which is the case for the main characters. Eli and Victor's relationship changes quite a lot over the 10 years. And those time jumps I understand and I enjoy. The others, not so much. They kind of feel like a gimmick at times, maybe even like the filler episodes of an anime. And that's kind of a thing about this book. This book is pretty much like an anime. If you like watching anime, I think you will like this book. What I really found intriguing about how the main characters got their powers was they had to sacrifice. They were not just given the powers, but the reason they did it was because they were ambitious. They just wanted to write a great thesis because they're overachievers. But also in this world, you can get superpowers accidentally as well. So there is an element of luck and also you can't exactly know what power you're going to develop, although it's somewhat dictated by the condition you're in. So it is somewhat rule based, but still a little bit random. This is not the type of book that is going to make you cry. You're not going to care about that one guy who dies and that other guy who lives or anything like that. But this is the kind of book you read on your commute. You don't want to cry your eyes out when you're riding the subway and people will come over and be like, oh, are you okay? What's wrong? And then you'll say, nothing, it's just my book is just so sad. Nobody wants that. It's relatively short. It's under 400 pages. Take it with you every day, read a little bit. Have some fun on your subway ride. Don't expect your life to be changed. Not all books has to do that. I had fun reading this book and as far as rating goes, I'm gonna say you should read it if you like. It's kind of interesting. I don't think it'd be a waste of time. But also, I don't think I'm gonna read the second book because I just don't care about anyone in this book. I don't really care about what happens to them after this. The ending was okay. Whatever you expect happens. Nothing out of ordinary. It's not unsatisfying. It's not particularly satisfying. I think it's pretty much in conformity with what you would expect from a book like this. So I don't think anyone would be disappointed with the ending of the book. I know that there are some different characters in the second book. So let me know in the comments if you think it's worth reading and then maybe I can check it out. All right, now let's get into some spoilers. So if you haven't read this book, I recommend you stop now. Since you haven't stopped, I'm gonna assume you already read this book or you just don't care. 
Okay, so one issue I've had with the characters, as I said, I just did not find them compelling enough. They didn't feel human to me. They had like little character quirks, like for example, Victor has problems with his family, but his relationship with his family was just so superficial. And one reason is because his family was just so cartoonish. And because there's no real relationship tension there, it's just because they are cartoon people and Victor is so cool, I just couldn't care about it. Another reason is because Victor didn't care about it either. When a character doesn't care about a certain relationship, but why should I care? He has an interesting way of dealing with his relationship with his parents where he just takes a marker and just blacks out the whole book and just leaves out some words and that was fun but that was pretty much it. It was just fun. There was nothing more to it. That just never paid off. It was just a character quirk. That was just something he did and I guess Eli's quirk was just he believed in God which turned out to be the reason why he went evil and started killing people because he just suddenly got into a prophet complex or something like that. You see, that's also not a compelling motivation to me. Now, there are other possible motivations, but the problem is because Eli is never called out on those, it just ends up staying that he is just killing EOs as part of his mission for God, getting the world rid of these unnatural beings. But number one, obviously, he himself is an EO. The rationale here is that his ability is internal and he is killing the EOs with external abilities. I would accept this if there was an instant where he would encounter another EO with an internal ability and he didn't kill that particular EO because his or her ability was also internal. I think that would have made it a little bit more clear for me. I would be like, okay, yeah, so he does have rules. He just came up with these random rules that he could kill some EOs with external abilities because you see, I don't know why. How did he end up coming up with this idea? And also before he got his extraordinary abilities, he never encountered another EO. I think it would have been stronger if he actually encountered an EO before he developed his thesis. So then there would be a reason why he focused on this so much. Especially for a book that goes back and forth quite a lot, it wouldn't be that difficult to show an experience where Eli would encounter a EO for the first time and that would launch the idea for his thesis. But that's not what happens. This comes completely out of nowhere. Now, if that is not the reason, if Eli is just killing the EOs because he wants to be the only one left, which makes more sense to me because that's kind of more like Eli's personality, right? We see a glimpse of it in the beginnings when Victor does not develop a superpower but he does then he just stops helping Victor because he just does not want him to develop a superpower as well. That seems to be a compelling reason for me because that fits Eli's character more. Now this could very well be the reason but the problem is Eli is never called out on it. I mean, this is a little bit prescriptive, but just for the fun of it, if the reason is actually because Eli is a megalomaniac, he just doesn't want any other EOs to exist, I wish there was a scene where Victor would call him out on that. Eli turning into a villain was just so out of nowhere. I understand why he turned on Victor because of their rivalry. I'm not 100% on board how he turned into a psychopath killer. I'm not sure I understand what his plan is. He is one person. Is his plan, he's just, is he just gonna kill all the EOs in North America? How about all the other EOs in the rest of the world? Like there might be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of EOs in the world. We don't know the number and how is he ever going to find all these EOs. In this particular instance, he got a little bit lucky because he met Serena by complete chance and then he saw the value in her and she was able to convince the police force to help Eli find out other EOs. But what was the initial plan? 
what was he hoping to do? Like every now and then find a random EO somewhere and then just like stalk them and kill them? I don't really understand where that serial killer personality came from. Now here is another prescriptive thing, just for fun. If Victor developed an extraordinary ability, but he prevented Eli from developing an ability, that would make Eli furious. And I would understand that because he's so competitive. And that, I would understand, would launch him on this path of hating all EOs and just like trying to get the world rid of them. But he himself being an EO just it doesn't make any sense. And his ability is not really central to his goal. He doesn't need to heal. I mean, it obviously gives him a huge advantage. But I think it would have been interesting if he could come up with other ways because he is just smart. He is very intelligent. He doesn't need superpowers to kill others with superpowers. Obviously, this is not the story. I'm just making these things up for fun. But I just think these would have helped me more to be on board with the story and the characters. And I think these would have given more opportunity for character development and character motivation. And all of these are already in the book. I'm not really adding anything. It's just like adjusting things. But maybe I just made it worse, who knows? I like the little different touch Mitch brings to the characters in this book. He is significantly different than everyone else. I just wish there was more to his character instead of just being sidekick, but unfortunately there wasn't. He also had a gimmick, right? He was just this big, strong guy, but he was smart, which is interesting, but it didn't really pay off for me. Another thing I found intriguing about this book was the relationship between Angie and Victor. Victor was in love with Angie and Eli does not seem to love Angie. He was sad for like five minutes after Angie died, but that was about it. So I had a prescriptive way of rearranging things. That's just, it's probably super stupid and not gonna work, but just play with me for a second. I'm changing the story quite a lot this time. Eli already steals Angie from Victor, right? Victor loves Angie, but Angie ends up with Eli. Victor is forever resentful for that. We know that. He just can't stop thinking about it. He sees them always together. He is upset. To that, add the fact that when Victor tried to develop his extraordinary ability, Eli didn't let it happen. He just called the ambulance early. He pretty much denied Victor the chance to develop the ability. And then after that, Victor helped Eli develop his extraordinary ability. But once Eli developed his ability, he again denied Victor the chance to develop a superpower. Now these things stacking up, let's say Victor still tries to develop an ability and in the process still ends up killing Angie, but because Angie is not experienced with this, he himself still couldn't go through the process properly and still couldn't develop an ability. Now I think all of these things adding up would have made Victor a fantastic villain. But obviously this would have been a completely different story and Eli is not much of a hero, so it would have been hard to find a protagonist for this story. But still, Victor having to cause Angie to die just to develop an extraordinary ability doesn't pay off. I thought Victor really loved Angie and I just could not see his devastation after that. The sacrifice he made, not only endangering his own life, but causing the death of the girl he loved, this really strong emotional moment, it just never pays off. I don't think he ever even thinks about it again. It doesn't turn into a driving force for Victor at all. And I think it could have. Another character is the teleport guy. Did anyone care about the teleport guy? He was just there, I guess, teleporting, helping the plot move forward. Overall, I enjoyed this book. I had fun. So especially if you like comic books and anime, I think there's a stronger chance that you will connect with this book. And if you did read this book and connect to it, but you never watched any anime, then you should. All right, thanks for staying with me for all this video. That's all I have to say about Vicious, and I'll see you next time.